Hi, I'm Dan Ashley, the evening news anchor for ABC 7 News in San Francisco, and I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe, healthy, and comfortable during these very challenging times. I am also a proud board member of the Commonwealth Club, one of our most important Bay Area institutions. The club has been hosting wonderful events with exciting speakers and topics in the Bay Area for over a century. In times of crisis, good information and strong connections in our community are especially important. And during the current COVID-19 crisis, the club has really stepped up. Since March 6th, the club has brought you over 100 live streamed events with speakers and panelists, including past governors, secretaries of state, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, mayors, county supervisors, respected medical experts, the president of the University of California, experts on anxiety and happiness in times of stress, and many, many more. Every program includes a live chat, so you and viewers all over the Bay Area and beyond have been able to ask these experts the questions that are on your minds. Every program has been neutral and unbiased in true Commonwealth Club style to get to the bottom of the issues that are so drastically affecting our lives. The club has done all this public service despite being profoundly affected by the crisis. The inability to hold events for the past two months has forced the club to cut its budget and staffing by 50%. The remaining staff are working from home to bring the community these valuable and informative live streamed programs. The club needs your support to continue its shelter at home programming. Please make a tax deductible donation to the club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the Commonwealth Club website commonwealthclub.org. We need the club to be here in the months and years ahead to help inform and educate as we figure out how to get our society and our economy safely moving again, consider changes to the way we live and work as a result of this crisis and take steps to prevent a future pandemic. Once again, please support the Commonwealth Club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the website commonwealthclub.org. I want to personally thank you for supporting one of our community's truly great organizations. I'll see you on ABC 7 News and at the Commonwealth Club. Stay safe. Hello everyone. Welcome to today's virtual program of the Commonwealth Club. I'm Denise Michaud, Chair of the Grown Ups Forum and your host for today. I'm really excited to have Rachel Freed here with us today. Um, she's coming live from Minnesota and that is one of the big advantages of virtual programs. We don't have to worry about distance or weather to get in the way. So let me tell you a little bit about um, Rachel. She is an author, educator, and facilitator. She is well known as the legacy expert. She has written six books about legacy and is the founder of Life Legacies. She is a licensed clinical social worker, and she is a senior fellow at the University of Minnesota Center for Spirituality and Healing. Rachel has helped many people create a meaningful way to preserve their story, history, values, and traditions. She also has a mission of giving women their voices and helping them value their life experiences. So for more on that, you can look at her book, Women's Legacies, Women's Lives, Women's Legacies. Today, Rachel will help us understand why it's so important for us to write about our life in today's world. Our program is about an hour, including a question and answer period at the end. Uh, so if you have any questions, please be sure to enter those in the YouTube chat room. So Rachel, I will go off line here 
and I will join you towards the end of the program. And please take it from here. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Denise. <clears throat> thank you, Denise. And thank you to the Commonwealth Club for inviting me to do this program. I'm very excited about it. Uh, legacy is really important to me and particularly in this time. Um, I'd like to begin by sharing with you the purpose of this particular program, which is to understand the significance of documenting the history of this pivotal moment in our lives and in the lives and history of future generations. I'm gonna start with three quotations that will help us understand the, the importance of this work. Lawrence Wright, who uh, writes for the Washington Post, wrote the following a couple of weeks ago. He said, the plague marked the end of the Middle Ages and the start of a great cultural renewal. Could the coronavirus, for all its destruction, offer a similar opportunity for radical change? And then a favorite writer of mine, a feminist who wrote in the 1990s, a book called A Chorus of Stones. Her name is Susan Griffin. And she wrote the following. Lately, I have come to believe that as yet, that an as yet undiscovered human need and even a property of matter is the desire for revelation. The truth within us has a way of coming out despite all conscious efforts to conceal it. I have heard stories from those in the generation after the war, all speaking of the same struggle to ferret truth from the silence of their parents so they themselves could begin to live. And finally, a man who I studied with some years ago PhD Terry Hargrave, who taught us that seniors, that'd be grownups in this uh, venue, seniors are entitled to the best care we can have. And yet we don't get away scot-free. We have a responsibility and that is to pass on our wisdom. So with those three people, I would like to start by sharing with you what legacy letters are and to share with you some examples of legacy letters about this time. So legacy letters historically were what was called the ethical will. It came out of the book of Genesis, the end of Genesis, when Jacob was dying and he called his 12 sons to him, not his daughter, Dina, uh, but he called his 12 sons to him and blessed them and asked them not to leave his bones down in Egypt, but to take them back to Canaan so that he could be with his ancestors for eternity. So fast forward about a thousand years or so, and the rabbis looked at this and said, what a great template to have our men write to their sons to pass on the values of our culture. Uh, so there were originally two components to the ethical will. One was blessings and the other was death and dying wishes. So fast forward to 1995 when I was introduced to the ethical will and I raced home after being introduced to it and said to myself, well, I'm not a man, but I have wisdom I want to share with my children. And I went straight to my computer and began to write to them. Then I went a few, few years later to a summer camp where there were uh, a number of classes and a, an adult study camp. And there was a uh, a rabbi teaching the ethical will. So I signed up for it and he was wonderful, very different than the other rabbi, read us poetry and so on. Went back the second year, same thing. Third year, I got to the door and he said, Rachel, 
<laughs> you've already taken this twice. And I said, yes, I know, but you're different by a year, two years. I'm different. The people will be different. So he said, okay, come on in. So in I went. It was a hot August afternoon. We were in Beloit, Wisconsin in a, at a college um, in a classroom. And he was reading poetry to us. And I all of a sudden heard a voice in my head. Now, I'm a very down here kind of girl. And I don't hear voices. I've never heard one before. And I have never heard one since. But this voice said to me, turn this into a healing tool for women. Well, so extrovert that I am, I raised up my hand. The rabbi called on me and I told him what I had heard. And he said, do it. It's an important niche. And with that, my life changed. So I began to do some classes um, on the ethical will, hadn't called them legacy letters yet, but nobody seemed to know what an ethical will was. And so I eventually changed its name to legacy letters, but I have tried to stay um, honest and respectful to the original ethical will. And so blessings are a big part of legacy letters and, um, and also, there are a couple of letters, a couple of legacy letters that I like to talk about, but people don't like to talk about too much, which is uh, a, a legacy letter to accompany our advanced directives, which are not very personal. They're legal documents, um, but we can there share with our families, for our families, what we really want at the end of life. And the other is a letter to go with our will so that our heirs will know the values that we had and how we made the decisions that we made. So that was my history. Um, I also added a number of topics um, to make this more accessible and contemporary. And those include things like um, writing the history of our ancestors, writing our history, always focused on values, however, and finishing with a blessing. Um, writing about making amends, special learnings that we've had in our experience, family secrets, uh, letters, I, I have already said to it, it, accompany our advanced directives and our financial wills. So my goal was to give women their voices uh, in ways accessible and doable in a short amount of time because nobody seems to have enough time. So I developed um, a template that would allow for people to write a legacy letter in four paragraphs. And the four paragraphs in the template, which by the way is on page 233 of my book, Your Legacy Matters. Um, and the uh, template talks about context, tells a story, tells a learning, and tells a blessing. And all legacy letters don't have to be written in that way, but it makes it easier. So I just wanna spend a moment on the urgency of us writing now, as Susan Griffin shared with us, the history is all in us anyway, and we need to be able to share it. But one day I was riding home, driving home and I heard on NPR a woman reading a legacy letter, she didn't call it that, that she was writing to her husband and daughter because she was a Mideast correspondent, 42 years old, and she was leaving to go overseas. And she said before she, before she wrote it, that she realized she had one more thing to do as she prepared to leave. And that was to sit down and write the letter, the letter she'd leave behind in case she died. So I wanna share that letter with you to give you an idea how simple and how deep a legacy letter can be. And I've changed the names. 
Dearest Jack and Rosie, if you're reading this, it means something terrible has happened. I write this with the full belief that I will be taking all the right precautions, but you never know. However, however deep your pain is, please understand that I was not cavalier and that I loved you both as truly and thoughtfully as I could all the way until the end and beyond. If I can leave you with anything, let it be a little advice. While it might not give you comfort now, let it someday inspire. All of us must meet our end someday. Don't let knowledge of that inevitable death bring you fear. Rather, look it in the face, walk toward it at times if you have to, because to live without fear is the only way to truly live. If my life means anything to you, let it be that. As the years go on, read this and know that my love is an ongoing postscript to my life, that it endures. Know, Jack, that you taught me as no one before what love truly is. And know, Rosie, that the day you came into the world was the happiest day of my life. Live on with the knowledge that you are loved, that you will be loved again and again by this wide and wonderful world. Yours, Kathy slash mom. So that's very short and it speaks to the urgency that I believe we have today, um, especially we're in a vulnerable position um, at our age um, to get COVID and perhaps to die from COVID. Um, I remember thinking at 9-11 that if everybody who had died, the 2,000 people who had died on that morning had left a legacy letter of love, like Kathy's letter, that the loved ones who were left behind would grieve in a different way. It isn't that they wouldn't grieve, of course they would grieve, but they would grieve in a different way because they would have something of the person who was gone. So, as I said, I developed this um, uh, template and the most important part about it, the part that I think people don't really understand is this idea of context. A wise man once said to me, there is no text without a context. So we have the possibility of writing um, a letter that tells a story of something and the lesson we learned from it and sends a blessing to the persons we love. And on top of that, we have the opportunity to do a little snapshot of history because we don't live in vacuums. We're all uh, involved with a world and a community, many communities probably, and families, and there's more than just us. And so if we start our letter with a little piece of history, then there's a context for what's being written. And then just a word about story. Uh, there's a lot of writing today, spiritual autobiography, memoirs, etc., uh, that write stories of people's lives. Legacy letters is very different from those types of writing because our goal is to pass on the values that we have extracted from our stories, that we have extracted from our experience to pass on to the next generation. That is the purpose of writing legacy letters. So I'll just read to you one letter that fits the uh, template that I wrote to my kids. It came to me as a memory. Uh, I was reading something and I recalled something that happened when I was just 22. So this was written quite a long time ago, 2005. And my son was quite young and I occasionally would send him things that I wrote and 
one day he sent me an email and he said, you know, mom, I don't really get what you're doing. And if you want to leave me wisdom, I need it now. I don't need it when you're dead. So I picked up the phone and I called him and he said, oh, oh, oh I'm in for it now. And I said, no, I was calling to ask you to go for go to lunch with me so that I could share some of my wisdom. Oh, OK. So we went to lunch at his favorite place. We talked a little baseball or football. I don't remember what season it was. And then I took out this letter that I had written and sent him and his sister several years earlier, but obviously he had never read it. And I said, you mind if I teach you by reading you the letter that I wrote in 2005? He said, okay, go ahead. So here's the letter that I, that I read to him. Dear Sid, that's my son, and Debbie, in the summer of 1961, your dad graduated from Officers Candidate School and began three years of service in the US Coast Guard. He was stationed at the Battery at the south end of Manhattan. We sublet a ground floor apartment on West 95th Street, just half a block from Central Park in Spanish Harlem. At 22, I was optimistic, confident, and naively fearless. My job that summer was to find a teaching position for the fall. That's the paragraph of context. Things that they would never ask me about and would probably never know unless I had written that to them. Here comes the story. One day on my way to some exciting exploration of the city, I got on the subway. I sat down and began to read. A pregnant homeless woman entered the car and began to beg for money. I averted my eyes, buried my face in my book and clasped my heart and my purse tightly. Silent minutes passed and suddenly the woman began to shout at the riders, crying out that it was okay if we didn't give her money, but it wasn't okay to avoid looking her in the face, that she was a human being. She picked up her bags and lurched through the door into the next train car. That's the story. Here's the lesson. I was shocked and shamed. Since then, even if I choose not to give to a person begging, I look the person in the eye. I feel more human when I acknowledge another's humanity. So that's the lesson, the value. And here's the blessing. So my beloved and precious children, Sid and Debbie, I offer you this blessing. May you both be blessed with compassionate and wise eyes, eyes that see beyond the face of circumstance, that see the spark of the divine deep within yourself, each other, and everyone on our planet. Love, Mom. And when I finished reading the letter, I looked up at my son who's sitting across from me, and there's a tear coming down his cheek. And he said to me, okay, mom, I get it. And I will never look at a homeless person in the same way again. So what more could a mother want than to pass on her wisdom while she's still alive and have her child actually get it? So um, At this particular time, the time of COVID, it seems to me that we're in a very pivotal moment in our history. And it makes me think back to the flu epidemic of 1918. In 1918, I had an aunt, of course, I wasn't alive yet. I had an aunt named Aunt Lillian, 15 years old, who died from the flu epidemic. And never did I hear a word about it, except that Lillian had died when she was 15. I never knew whether anybody else in the family was ill. I never knew how it changed the family. I never knew what their reactions were. I knew nothing. So when this epidemic came, it dawned on me that we live in a different time, a time when we want to share with those we love 
for those who come after what's happening to us and our families in this particular moment. So, um, let me read to you. Um, this is not set up as a letter, but it's a writing about this time that I think will give you an idea of the kind of thing that we can write to our children and grandchildren. This is by a woman named Michelle Rydell. She's from Byron, Michigan. It was written in June of this year. And it's by a mom to her daughter. And it's titled, You Will Want to Remember This. Maybe not next year or the year after, but someday when the shock and horror wear off, when we're sitting next to each other at say a baby shower or a band concert, so close that my sleeve brushes yours and we exchange a look that recalls these strange days, you will want to. You will want to remember how it felt to wake up in the morning, how it took a moment for the cloud of sleep to lift and then another for the cloud of day to settle and how you would ask yourself, what did I do yesterday? Did I shower? Did it rain? You will want to remember how you passed the time, how you became mesmerized by colorful cardboard shapes and lettered tiles and playing cards. How you drifted off in thought mid-turn, worrying about the kids at school. You'll want to remember how at last, when you had all the time in the world to read, you couldn't tame your mind beyond a sentence. Maybe like me, you lost yourself in a closet or a drawer, emerging hours later, aimlessly clutching saved baby clothes and keychains bought on vacation. Maybe like me, you felt guilt and relief about being healthy, safe, spared. Maybe like me, you cried watching a music video, a dreamy haunting rendition of A Day in the Life, so harrowingly beautiful, it hurt. You'll want to remember how in this time, some people turned inward, some to nature, some to humor, some to God. How when we all felt helpless, some made bread, others art. Some made masks, others wore them. How phrases like virus shedding and social distancing became part of our vernacular. How we ran out of ways to say unprecedented. How we kept running tallies of our infected and our dead. How you stopped caring or started caring or wished you'd been a better daughter. You'll want to remember how you changed, how you went from the rigid enforcer to letting your kids eat cake in the bedrooms, how you learned to wait, how you learned what mattered. Maybe you made a schedule. Maybe you upheld the bedroom routine. Maybe you called your mom at midnight just to hear her sigh and tell you to get some sleep. You need to remember this. I want you to remember this because years from now, a lifetime from now, when we're leaving somewhere saying goodbye, when I'm hugging you tight and tighter still, and we both laugh and yet I don't let go, you will know why. So that could easily be made into a legacy letter. The context is of course already there and it could end more specifically with a blessing and would be a perfect legacy letter for this mother to give to her daughter at this time. So then I have um, <clears throat> 
I train facilitators in doing legacy writing, and there are about 40 of us, a few more, all around this country, and a couple in Canada and one in Mexico City. And during this time, I decided that it would be a wonderful time for them to get together and sort of build community, and that I would like to be with them um, also. Now, they only knew the people that they trained with, and I trained, I'm still training people, but they trained for many different years. So I wrote them an email, and I suggested that um, we come together on Zoom, which we did, and everybody introduced themselves and told each other what they did in Legacy and so on. And at the end of the time, I said, do you want to do this again? Oh, yes, they wanted to do it again. So I said, okay, let's set up another time about a month from now. And this time I will send something for you guys all to write. And then we can share that when we get together. They said, okay, fine. So that's what we did. And I want to read a letter from, well, so what I asked them to write was to write something about this time that mattered to them, that made a difference in their lives. And at the same time, I talked to my web guru and I said, if I had material for a blog on the website, life-legacies.com, that people could go to and read some of these things, is that a possibility? Could we do that? Oh yeah, he said that would be easy. So we put a link on the front page of the, of the website and I've been adding things that people have written over this time. It's gotten quite lengthy now, but it's worth a read, I can assure you. Anyway, um, of all these 40, I think there are 43 of us, including me, there are only two men, both of whom are from Minnesota, I'm proud to say. And one of them wrote and read in our gathering the following letter, which I think is magnificent. So let me share it with you. It's titled, The Fire Next Time. It is no accident that we suffered the loss of an innocent black man's life at the hands of the police and the protests and riots that ensued, which literally burned parts of our beloved city of Minneapolis to the ground while we're undergoing a worldwide pandemic. Moments in history like this leave a legacy for those of us experiencing them in real time and for future generations. Is it possible we can glean a lesson from these two events happening at the same time, or dare we say even a blessing. I'd like to share with you my children, grandchildren and great grandchildren, the legacy I witnessed on those fateful days in May, 2020. First, I am writing this and you are reading this as a person born with white skin. I cannot speak to nor pretend to identify with the deep anger, grief, and frustration of my black and brown brothers and sisters who have endured the ungodly oppression and discrimination at the hands of our society over these past 400 years. When I witnessed in horror the fires burning in Minneapolis, destroying the third police precinct, the businesses and homes of innocent people, the looting of stores, I was filled with anger and rage at the perpetration of these unlawful acts in the name of protest. But then something happened to me when I was able to read the message that lay beneath the smoke. The message, this is in caps, now can you hear us? I realized that those fires were being set by generations of people of color in this country. And I remembered why it all suddenly made sense. I remembered reading African-American author James Baldwin's letter 
to his young nephew in 1963. Baldwin's legacy letter to his young nephew was written on the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation in this country and described his reality of growing up black in America. The title of the book, The Fire Next Time, was a biblical reference recalling God's warning to the people of Noah's time. Once the floodwaters had receded, that the destruction of ungodly people will not come from water, but from the fire next time. I recalled these words as I watched our city burn. But I also witnessed something else during those days of looting, rioting, and protesting, something that gave me faith and hope for the future. I saw thousands of my fellow citizens from all races and creeds, shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm, raising their voices and calling for justice and a society based on love, not hate, understanding and tolerance, not prejudice. At a time when a deadly virus is killing thousands of us because we are not isolating ourselves from each other, maintaining social distance or wearing face masks, people were willing to risk death to this virus in order to come together and unmask the faces of white privilege and systemic racism. And so this is the lesson I want you, my children and grandchildren to remember. That for the majority of citizens on the streets of Minneapolis over those fateful days in May, the desire to undo and address the wrongs and injustices suffered by people of color so that they could truly live emancipated lives in America was stronger than the desire for their own self-preservation. There is a word for this, love. The kind of love that James Baldwin's, Baldwin was prophetic enough to write about to his young nephew over 57 years ago, when he argued for a love that, quote, takes off the mask that we fear we cannot live without and know we cannot live within, end quote. Um, let me just check my notes here for a moment. I'm hoping that I gave you enough examples, very different kinds of examples, so that even if you can't write as eloquently as you'd wish, that each of us can find a way to leave a legacy at this pivotal moment in the life of our families and our communities for the sake of future generations. If you want to know more, I've just given you a taste of legacy letters. You can visit www.life-legacies.com and there you, you can subscribe to my monthly free one-page email titled Legacy Tips and Tools. I have been writing for about 10 years. And you can also get my most recent book, which is for both men and women and intergenerational. And it is called Your Legacy Matters. And you can buy it at Amazon or you can get it ordered from your favorite uh, independent bookstore in whatever town you live in. So I would like to close with a blessing before we take questions and answers. And that blessing is this. May you be blessed to experience the fulfillment that comes with taking responsibility. May you be blessed with the gift of knowing who, you're, who you are and your part in the world. And may your legacy letters broaden understanding and compassion 
for you and your loved ones and for the sake of future generations. Namaste. Denise, please come in and let's do some questions. Hi, Rachel. Thank you so much for sharing those beautiful, heartfelt letters. Um, so we have a, a couple of questions. One would be, uh, what topics do you, would you suggest that people write about? What, what are the various topics out there that could stimulate someone's you know, imagination? Well, I think um, right now we don't need much to stimulate ourselves. We've got COVID and we've got racism and we've got a number of other issues that we certainly could write about to our children and grandchildren. But generally speaking, and, and in both a women's lives, women's legacies, and in your legacy matters, there are chapters on all kinds of things, like um, it's a chapter on stuff. You know, like as we age, we want to get rid of stuff and our kids don't want our stuff. Um, but some of that stuff is important to us. And there are people who say, well, you need to pick out what matters of that stuff and you need to label it and you need to let somebody know in a legacy letter what, um, what those things are. And there is um, documentation that when people are, I was gonna say forced, maybe they're not forced, but when people need to leave their private homes and go into some other kind of housing, they need to have some of their things with them, the things that matter, because that helps the transition and it provides some kind of continuity and sense of I'm still myself, even if I'm not in my home anymore. So that chapter about stuff, that's the outer stuff. And then there's inner stuff that we need to clean up and we can write about. And some of that might be in our journals and some of it might be um, something for a legacy letter. Um, people often ask me, go ahead. I was thinking like if people went through their old photos, you know, from years and years, that might trigger some questions or some stories. That sure. Yeah. Pass on. Actually, so interesting. The story, my subway story came from, I was reading a little book called Everything You Need to Know. It was a mother who was writing this little book of rules for her daughter as she was leaving for college. And as she was writing it, she remembered how proud she was of her daughter who taught her that she needed to look people in the face. Mm. And it triggered this memory for me of when I was 22 years old. So I raced to my computer to write that memory before it disappeared and what that meant to me. Um, so that's, you know, that I think, Pictures are a good thing. What's in your closet and drawers, as as uh, Ms. Rydell read. Um, you never know what's going to trigger a memory that you want to pass on because it gives a value to your life. And it tells you who you are to your children and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Another question, by the way, that comes up is, well, what if I don't have any children? I get that always in a workshop. And my response is, um, Marianne Williamson once said, we are all mothers of the planet. And so we don't know, need to have children of our own. We may have nieces and nephews. We may have friends. We may have a next door neighbor. Um, we can be writing to anybody. And the people that we write to could be those in... Um, older generations than us, younger generations than us. One of my favorite, favorite legacy letters is a legacy red letter that I wrote to the rabbi who said, who pointed his finger at me and said, do this, it's an important niche. And years later, while I was doing a workshop of gratitude and about our angels and mentors, I realized that I had never thanked him. 
And so I wrote him a legacy letter and reminded him of that time at the camp and how important his response to me was and how grateful I was. So letters of gratitude are a very wonderful topic for legacy letters. Um, I think I've already mentioned a letter to go with your advanced directive and a letter to go with your will. And another question, <laughs> I'm not letting you ask the question, <laughs> I'm thinking of them myself. <laughs> but another question that I always get asked is, well, do we save these until we're dead or do we give them while we're still alive? And, um, you know, there's no right or wrong of this. There are some things that you may not want to share while you're alive. And there are some things that you want to share now or when you think your child or grandchild is ready. So again, no right or wrong, but you'll know yourself mm -hmm. when you write it, what it's meant for. One of my facilitators once called me almost crying. She said, you know, I, I've written my three daughters. I have four daughters. I've written three daughters legacy letters for their 50th birthdays. And my youngest daughter is significantly younger. What if I don't live to write her her 50th birthday letter? And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can write it now. Put it in your drawer. And when she turns 50, you'll give it to her. And if you don't live till she's 50, by the time she gets to be 50, she can look in your drawer and she'll find her 50th birthday letter. So again, um, celebrating moments in people's lives, graduations, first jobs, new baby, weddings, anniversaries, all those are wonderful occasions to write legacy letters uh, of love for. I know so many families, unfortunately, that are estranged from each other or from one person, one sibling or parent. Yeah. How important is that to, you know, maybe even get out the emotions on a letter, even if you're not going to send it? Well, that, that reminds me about anger. Um, and I always say to people, think about when you write your legacy letters, think about 50 years in the future when you're gone and somebody reads this letter, do you think they want to hear about your anger? My response to that is no. So <laughs> write the anger in your journals, burn it, keep it, write it in a letter, burn it, keep it, whatever. But don't send those kinds of letters. These kinds of letters are really letters of love and, and they need to be. Now, what was your question again? Well, I guess what, you know, when they're estranged. Oh, estranged. Well, still, they feel that anger, right? And yeah, um, but but I think um, it's interesting. One of the one of the things that I've done during this time is um, I love Zoom, so I, I started this group of my facilitators on Zoom, and then I thought, well, I have of the twelve cousins on my maternal side, there are now seven of us left, mm. and I thought we we'll live all over the country and in Costa Rica, we haven't seen each other in 40 or 50 years. Wow. And wouldn't it be great to get together on Zoom and just introduce ourselves to each other and tell each other about our lives? So I sent out an email and they all thought it was a fabulous idea. And they came and we talked and everybody shared. And I said, should we meet again? Oh yes, we should meet again in another month. And so I suggested to them that they go into their closets and find pictures of their parents who would be their parents and our aunts and uncles so that we could share them on this next um, get together. So from being very estranged, we are now very eager to know each other. And who knows, it might be the time, it might be the virus, it might be who knows what what happened, but mm. nobody said no thank you. They all wanted to do it. So we're doing our own little legacy thing just with my cousins. That's beautiful. That's yeah. Beautiful. yeah. So I want to go over just your template again to make yeah. sure I understand that. So there's 
different components. One is, why don't you go over it? Like context, story, lesson, yeah. lesson. I can actually, I can actually read you uh, some little pieces of it. Um, as I said, it's, it's in the appendix of your legacy matters on page two thirty two and three. Um, but it's four paragraphs. And by the way, all legacy letters don't have to be following this template. It's just that it's really an easy, uh, an easy way to get started if you have trouble writing. So here's what I said. No matter the content, a memory, a value, a story, a life lesson learned, a blessing, etc. A template provides a structure to make writing legacy letters easier. A legacy letter can be accomplished in four simple paragraphs in less than a half hour. Here is a template you may wish to use as a guide. Paragraph one, context. Provide history and context. We are seldom aware that the context beyond our present personal lives affects us. The time when family history was contained in a family Bible and passed down from generation to generation is long gone. An opening paragraph providing a context for what follows gives your reader a snippet of family history, a snapshot of historical times enriching the story that follows. So that's the context paragraph. Mm -hmm. Story, paragraph two. All of us have a sacred story and all of us want to tell our stories. It is by writing our stories that we experience belonging, feeling known, and linking ourselves to past and future generations. The story may be about any subject, a value, a memory of an ancestor, an explanation about precious things, an apology, an expression of gratitude, celebration of family moments, an accomplishment to, um, an accompaniment to will, a living will, and your financial will that you want to preserve and pass forward. Tell the story with details that make it memorable and unique. This letter will contain only one of your many stories and their meaning to you. Paragraph three, learning. The story is not as meaningful as it can be unless you write what you learned from it. Mm -hmm. Uncover, clarify, and state the lesson or value learned from the story. Learning from our experience is often defined as wisdom. It's this learning with the story that we want to preserve and pass forward to future generations as their legacy. You know, it that just reading that reminds me to say, um, and I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, it, just to underscore the difference between legacy writing and autobiography or memoir, where the purpose of it is just to tell your story. And for us, as we tell pieces of that story, our big story changes. And so we're not just our stories, we're the meaning of our stories. Mm -hmm. And that's what's important for legacy. And when you ask people of, of their values, everybody says the same thing. Oh, the family should stay together, everybody should be kind, et cetera. And those are, and that's true, they're all great values, but they aren't personal values. But when they come out of a story that you have told, then the value makes sense and is personal. Hmm. And it makes all the difference. And then finally, paragraph four, offer a blessing. Your blessing should flow naturally from your story and your learning. Not surprisingly, we experience being blessed as we bless future generations with their history. We're not always aware of the impact of being blessed, but we all yearn for blessings from our elders. The ancient ethical will extracted from the story of Jacob um, is the same Jacob who earlier stole his brother's birthright 
and got Isaac to bless him instead of Esau. And the sweetest line, I think, in the whole, whole Bible is this realization where Esau responds with a plea to his father. And he says to his father, it's a quote, have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. I believe we never outgrow our need for blessings. So any other? What do, you, what do you say to people who say, I'm not a writer. And so they feel, you know, inhibited about putting right. out the words. Yeah. They don't know where to start. Well, I always say to people, did you ever write a letter? And everybody says yes, because before emails, we did write letters. And that's how you need to think about this. I used to be an English teacher before I was a therapist and a social worker. <laughs> and I used to always say to, to my students, write the way you speak. Mm. So it's just like writing onto the paper, uh, speaking onto the paper. And you can always go back and edit it and change it. You might not have had the exact right word that you wanted. There's always a dictionary and a thesaurus available and uh, you can always make changes, but just to speak what matters to you is what makes a legacy letter real. They don't have to be a great writer. Mm. And what would you say to younger people out there? Are they just younger going people. on with their lives and they're, or they're just starting their lives and they're kind and of they've got plenty of and they've got plenty of time to write about yes. what's happening to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, you know, the first example that I shared of the woman who was going overseas to be a correspondent in Syria, she was only 42 years old and she was writing a legacy letter. She didn't know she was writing a legacy letter mm -hmm. per se, but that's what that was. And so it's not for just for grownups. It's not just for old people. It's for all of us because we don't know when we're going to die. Nobody knows when we're going to die. We know we'll all die, but we never know when. You mean you could cross the street and be gone, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you have things to say to people you love, get them down on paper. Um, well, for people who want to continue this legacy, to continue legacy writing and get better at it, what, what tips would you give them? Um... Well, of course, I could I could say buy my book, <laughs> um, which I would say. Join a workshop, right? You have workshops. Do a workshop. Um, I'm doing four workshops this fall for Saging International, which is for grownups mm -hmm. um, on different topics. Um, I think that uh, probably the easiest the easiest way to get started is to uh, go to the website and read a little bit about what the ethical will was, what examples there are and so on. And then to subscribe to Legacy Tips and Tools. It's free, comes on your email, it's one page, um, one page that is chock full of reflection and then action steps. So you can write one legacy letter a month by just following the legacy tips and tools. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Do you have any final words before we close the program? Um, can I reread my blessing? Yes, actually. Yes. I was thinking of that myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here we are at the end of our hour mm -hmm. and I have loved every minute of it. And I hope people have gotten a lot out of it. And I appreciate the opportunity to have been able to do this. Thank you, Denise, very much. Uh, and here's the blessing. May you be blessed to experience the fulfillment that comes with taking responsibility. May you be blessed with the gift of knowing who you are and your part in our world. And may your legacy letters broaden understanding of our times for you and for your loved ones and for the sake of future generations. 
Namaste. Namaste. Thank you, Rachel Freed, for sharing all of your experience and those very poignant, heartfelt letters too, and encouraging us to share our own feelings, you know, with, with our loved ones. So this concludes our virtual program at the Commonwealth Club. Thank you so much for joining us today.